Uh, Andy Ramana is the Simons Chair in Disarmament, Global and Human Security and Director of the Liu Institute for Global Issues at the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. He is the author of The Power of Promise, Examining Nuclear Energy in India, and co-editor of Prisoners of the Nuclear Dream. Ramana is a member of the International Panel of Fissile Materials, the Canadian Progress Group, the International Nuclear Risk Assessment Group, and the team that produced the annual World Nuclear Industry Status Report. He is the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship and the 2014 Leo Zillard Award from the American Physical Society. That's uh, the award that is given every year by the Forum on Physics Society that is sponsoring uh, today's session. Uh, so Ramana, thank you for joining us today from uh, Vancouver. And we look forward to um, hearing about uh, your perspective on Thanks. nuclear energy and climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Thank you for the invitation. And I'm sorry that I cannot join you in person. Uh, I'm, I'm hearing some echo. Is it possible to mute something? No, I guess not. OK. Um, I'm sorry that I can't join you. There was a email glitch as a result of which I never received any invitation until early this week when we realized that something was wrong. Uh, so that's why I could not be there in person with all of you. Uh, so my uh, talk is going to be mostly focused on uh, why I think nuclear energy is an infeasible solution to climate change. Um, it's, uh, you know, I'm sure that others are going to have different perspectives on this, uh, but perhaps uh, I'm going to make my argument as strongly as I can, and perhaps that will make uh, my co-panelists, Ed and Aditi, seem much more reasonable than I am. Um, so I'm going to start very briefly with a over overview of where nuclear energy is today. And I will just sort of cut to the chase and say uh, the best days of nuclear reactor construction are over about three decades ago. Uh, the world's nuclear power plants were mostly built in the 1970s and 80s. And since the mid 1980s, the construction of nuclear power plants has essentially uh, slowed down drastically. And there have been even some years since then when more nuclear plants have been shut rather than started. As a result, the overall uh, uh, nuclear uh, 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 generation capacity has remained more or less stagnant. A nuclear plant takes about 10 uh, years on average to be constructed. And this also means that uh, the time it's going to for any nuclear uh, power uh, to contribute, a new nuclear power to contribute to uh, either power generation or climate mitigation is that much further away. So just this year, for example, uh, recently uh, a new generation of nuclear plants, uh, the so-called EPR reactor, just came online in Finland. Uh, that was uh, you know, supposed to have been uh, constructed in about four years, but uh, it was 13 years behind schedule. Uh, and uh, this is the uh, French design, which was based on extensive experience in France with other kinds of uh, reactor construction. So this is not something which is a problem for new nuclear reactor designers, but even for experienced ones. The result of uh, the slowdown of nuclear power plant construction and the fact that things are, uh, it takes such a long time to construct plants means that the global share of electricity uh, generated uh, produced by nuclear plants has been declining consistently since the mid 1990s. Uh, it's now just around 10%, uh, which is around 40% below the um, maximum it ever was uh, of 17.5%. Um, around in the same time scale, you can see that the share of uh, renewables has been growing drastically, uh, much, much uh, quicker. Uh, and uh, the contrast between them tells you something about where, what we think the relative share of these two climate mitigation also will be. In the United States too, uh, nuclear electricity generation continues to decline as more and more reactors retire. And I'll get to why reactors are being retired uh, in a few slides. Uh, and this is also true in France where um, the uh, overall nuclear electricity generation has declined by about a, a quarter uh, 
since uh, 2005 uh, when it was uh, the maximum. Even the most optimistic projections put out by the International Atomic Energy Agency, um, which is, as you know, is an um, a institution that has been set up to promote uh, the peaceful uses of nuclear power, uh, among other things, uh, do not foresee nuclear energy really growing very drastically. And uh, even its most optimistic projections um, only uh, envision uh, nuclear power maintaining market share of around 10%. Uh, but the IAS projections have typically been uh, much larger than what has actually materialized. And so one would expect that uh, nuclear energy will only be declining in market share. And now coming back to the question of climate change, that's a really bad trend. If you think about if nuclear power were to be contributing to climate change, what would have to happen is that its share of electricity generation should be increasing at the cost of fossil fuel uh, share. And that's just not happening. Why is this the case? The main reason is that nuclear power is just not economically competitive. Uh, reactors, uh, as I already mentioned, take a long time to build, but they also cost too much to build. And if you look at the uh, cost of nuclear power in the United States, uh, the, uh, the Wall Street uh, 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 consulting company called Lazard uh, sort of estimates that it costs roughly of the order of about $160 per megawatt hour of electricity to, uh, from nuclear power plants. In contrast, uh, the cost of solar and wind are around $35 to $40 per megawatt hour. So nuclear power is more than four times uh, the cost of uh, other low carbon sources of electricity. And the trend has been that uh, solar and wind have been falling quite rapidly, whereas nuclear costs have actually been going up. And I'll come back to this point later on. Uh, for a long time, the, uh, the story was that uh, nuclear power plants cost a lot to build, but once you build, they are going to be profitable because their operating costs are going to be low. Uh, and therefore, in the long run, a utility that builds a nuclear plant will actually make uh, money. But that, has, that story has come unstuck in the last decade or so, as the alternative uh, sources of power have become cheaper, while uh, the older nuclear plants, the operational costs of them have been increasing. As a result, uh, in the United States, as well as in other countries, several old reactors are shutting down, uh, simply because they are unable to make money uh, in competitive electricity markets. Uh, this is also true in the case of the uh, Diablo Canyon plant, which has been in the news a lot because there is a, uh, a push by uh, nuclear power plant uh, advocates to try and keep it open. Uh, but if you went back to uh, the period just before PG&E, the utility that owns uh, Diablo Canyon decided to shut it down, uh, their basic reason was that it was seen to be uh, economically not viable to keep it open uh, in the longer term. They actually contracted with a private consulting company called MJ Brandy to do an outlook for what uh, the economics of keeping Diablo Canyon are going to be is going to be, and uh, the this, the result was that it was going to be. Uh, not a viable proposition for pg &E. And that's the main reason they were shutting it down. Uh, the so-called nuclear renaissance that people used to talk about in the uh, beginning of this uh, century, especially after the Bush administration passed the Energy Policy Act, uh, has kind of fizzled out. Uh, there was a brief increase in uh, the rate of nuclear power plant construction, but that has kind of declined. And in the United States specifically, uh, uh, at that time, in the, in the mid to late 2000s, around 30 reactors were ordered and about 15 gigawatts, that's about 15 large nuclear plants, were expected to come online by 2021. Uh, in actual fact, only four reactors actually started construction, of which two were abandoned after about $9 billion plus was spent in the uh, state of South Carolina. Essentially, the cost overruns became so large that the utility as well as the company that was uh, providing the design Westinghouse 
uh, decided it was not possible. Westinghouse, in fact, uh, declared uh, filed for bankruptcy protection. So all that is left of the so-called nuclear renaissance in the United States are two very expensive nuclear plants being nuclear reactors being built in the state of Georgia in Vogel. Those two units are now more than thirty billion dollars in cost estimates and at least six six years behind schedule. Uh, and this is to be compared with uh, the initial the, the cost estimate when construction started of about fourteen billion dollars, but also when the uh, nuclear renaissance talk started in the early 2000s, uh, Westinghouse, the company that uh, designed the AP-1000 reactors that are being built there, talked about building these at the cost of about uh, uh, three to five billion dollars uh, for this. So this is now much more than what was initially estimated based on paper designs. Uh, and uh, as uh, Peter Brandt a former member of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission said, you know, it has not yet avoided a single molecule of carbon emissions. And if the $40 billion that's been spent on it had gone instead to the many less expensive and more reliable energy sources, the climate and the country would be far better off. Uh, I'll now turn to this new wave of uh, reactor designs that uh, the nuclear industry has been touting, the so-called small modular reactors. Uh, these are reactors that are said to be solving all of the many problems associated with nuclear power. But I want to remind you, start this by reminding people that these are really paper designs at this point. Uh, there is not a single one of them that's been built, and the few that have been built in other countries have not fared very well, and I'll talk about that later. So that's something you should be remembering when uh, you read news about small modular reactors and the claims that they will be cheap, they are cheaper, and things of sort, which are really uh, not uh, based on any empirical uh, uh, evidence. Uh, just very briefly, what are small modular reactors? By definition, small modular reactors have to generate less than 300 megawatts of electricity, but this buzzword has become so popular that some designs which are even larger than 300 megawatts do claim to be small modular reactors. Uh, uh, they do not have to be physically small, just to uh, point. Uh, they vary a lot in terms of their size. Uh, and the other uh, term in the term small modular reactor is the word modular, um, refers to the fact that the idea is to assemble a nuclear plant by uh, putting together modules that have been manufactured in factories, sort of like Lego blocks. And in, in fact, I used to say this a long, long time and then uh, recently, there was a video presentation by the chairman of the French Atomic Energy Commission that actually uses Lego blocks to uh, demonstrate their design. So that's actually a very good um, metaphor for trying to think about small modular reactors. Unfortunately, unlike uh, Lego blocks, they are not uh, as uh, harmless and you cannot give it to ch little children to play with. Um, the, the, the problem with small modular reactors is that they are said to be solving a number of different problems. Uh, including uh, reduction of the amount of waste that they generate, including reducing the risk of uh, nuclear uh, weapons proliferation, uh, and uh, reducing the risk of uh, accidents. Uh, and uh, my former colleague Zia Mia and I looked at a number of designs and we just realized that it is not possible for all properties uh, to be realized in one design. And that's because these different uh, priorities, uh, safety, for example, or proliferation uh, uh, reduction, all pull in very different directions. Um, but most importantly for the discussion that we're taking, small reactors also mean that they're going to be more expensive. And this is because they lose out on what are called economies of scale. It does not take uh, five times as much concrete or you don't need five times as many workers to construct uh, or operate a nuclear plant that generates 1,000 megawatts as compared to a 200 megawatt plant. Uh, and for the same sort of reasons, they will also generate more spent fuel, more weight, will require more uh, fuel, uh, the, and they will have a higher proliferation risk, all else being equal. Um, learning for nuclear power also might make plants more expensive because as you get more experience, you, you realize there are more safety risks. And this has been empirically demonstrated in the two countries that have built the most nuclear plants, the United States and France, in both places, at a fleet-wide level, costs have only gone up. And in the case of small modular reactors, for them to 
make up for their loss of economies of scale, they would have to be built in the hundreds, if not the thousands, uh, to just catch up with large nuclear plants, uh, let alone uh, go with, um, uh, to, to compare, compete with renewables. Uh, the experience so far with the small modular reactors that have been constructed uh, has been more of the same, that it is things have not worked out. Uh, for example, all actual projects have been delayed. In Argentina, for example, uh, there was a reactor that's under construction since 2014. It's not, it's, it's about 70% complete. No completion date has been given. Uh, China recently um, uh, started two uh, high temperature gas cool reactors uh, that were four years late. Uh, the Russians uh, commissioned uh, a, a floating nuclear power plant that's about 10 years late. Uh, in the United States, uh, the most advanced project, New Scale, uh, is at least about 15 years late uh, compared to what was initially projected. And there's every likelihood it, be, it could become even later uh, because the Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards identified some significant safety problems with the design. So if these are going to be fixed, it's quite possible that the reactor might be even uh, more delayed. Um, the costs for the uh, new scale plant have been uh, increasing consistently. The most, uh, the recent of these cost estimates uh, from the head of the utility that is planning to build one of these uh, puts this cost at around $11,000 per kilowatt. This is the overall cost, not the overnight cost. And that's about 80% more than the Vogel uh, nuclear plants in Georgia that I mentioned earlier. Uh, when construction started. And Woggle, of course, more than doubled in cost. So you might expect something similar to happen in the case of new scale as well. Uh, just to very briefly, just to sort of uh, uh, quickly run through the rest of it, you know, I just want to remind people that small modular reactors are nuclear reactors, which means that they can also undergo accidents. Uh, the probability of accidents at any nuclear plant is always uncertain. Uh, because people cannot always uh, predict in advance what kind of accident pathways will be taken, but it's certainly greater than zero. So in other words, there's no such thing as safe nuclear power. Uh, small nuclear power, of uh, all nuclear power plants produce radioactive waste that remain hazardous for hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, and the technical challenges of dealing with this kind of waste coupled with all kinds of uh, social concerns about uh, not wanting to live near a dump of uh, waste that is going to be hazardous for these long periods, concerns about future generations and so on, mean that uh, there is no operating nuclear waste repository for commercial reactor fuel. Uh, and as such, there is no demonstrated solution for this. Uh, it is possible that in some countries they may be able to build one of these, but these are very exceptional uh, places rather than the norm. Um, so let me sort of conclude, uh, go back to the, what I basically started and ask the question, should we expand nuclear power to deal with climate change? Uh, so the, the argument that most people are familiar with, which I also have uh, written about at length, uh, is that this is not a desirable solution uh, at best. Uh, so nuclear power, as I mentioned, comes with the risk of uh, catastrophic accidents as happened in Chernobyl and in Fukushima. Uh, it is uh, deeply uh, implicated with uh, nuclear weapons production because every nuclear power plant automatically produces materials that could be used in nuclear weapons. And so countries that have nuclear power uh, have the technical capacity uh, if, uh, and it's only a matter of will and other political uh, considerations whether they can actually go ahead and make nuclear weapons or not. And lastly, it also produces waste that uh, we don't have a, 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 a sort of feasible or demonstrated solution for. But this is a familiar argument. Many people uh, are know about it. Uh, the uh, answer that some people might say is, well, you know, the climate challenge is so dire that we need to think about all possible options. In fact, the, the, uh, they say all options should be on the table. But nuclear power as an option has always existed on the table. It's just not proven to be right. But the more important reason to sort of forget about nuclear power is that it is not a feasible solution. Uh, I've already explained to you why nuclear power plants are so expensive. Uh, and that's a, you know, a simple way of understanding why they are so expensive is that a nuclear power plant is just a complicated way to boil water. Uh, and you're doing so using a very hazardous process 
which is going to produce all kinds of uh, difficult materials to handle under conditions that are not easy. Uh, and so it is not going to be ever cheap. Uh, and uh, given that we have a finite amount of resources to be able to spend on climate change, uh, it is much better to spend it on uh, proven and more sustainable solutions, uh, including renewables and the various technologies that go with it. But the more important uh, reason that's been coming up in recent years uh, is uh, as the uh, most recent um, climate uh, change uh, IPCC report uh, talked about, we need to be reducing emissions right now as quickly as possible. And nuclear power simply cannot contribute on this time scale. Um, it's a very slow uh, construction process. Uh, just raising the finances for building one of these takes a very long time. And so any money and any time and any effort that we are putting in, into nuclear power is actually detracting from doing other things. And so in a way, it's actually the opposite of a climate solution. It's actually a burden on trying to deal with climate change. Okay, I'll stop here. I'm happy to take any questions. And I'm gonna stop okay. sharing my slides. Thank you so much, uh, Ramana. You were, you know, you were perfectly on time even uh, you finish even early, so we, we have plenty of time for questions. So uh, I don't see any questions online, so uh, please, uh, I'm going to switch on this microphone so the speakers can hear you. And if he doesn't, I'll repeat the question. Can you hear me? And could you speak up? I'm having difficulty hearing you. Um, can you hear me now? Can you yeah. hear me? Yes. So my question is, um, the construction delay that you were talking about, has it gone, has it gotten worse now than say in the, back in the 60s and whatnot? Or, uh, and, and then of course, this another part to that, what exactly is it that causes the construction delay? I know you, you talked about the cost and how complicated it is, but has it gotten worse than back when, when we were building, you know, uh, some of these in the 60s? Say. Yeah, if I if I heard you right, you were asking, has the have construction delays become worse with time, and also why is it uh, taking it longer now as compared to the nineteen sixties? Am I right? Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, yes and no. So the, uh, the compared to the nineteen sixties or seventies, the very early round of construction. Yes, nuclear plants take much longer uh, to build. And a, a lot of it has to do with the fact that I mentioned earlier, which is what we have learned about nuclear plants since then has been the fact that they can undergo catastrophic accidents under certain levels. And also smaller accidents, which can still be very expensive for the utility to deal with. Uh, you don't need a Chernobyl-like disaster uh, even something relatively small like Three Mile Island uh, has meant that, um, you know, uh, what was once a, a fairly um, uh, valuable um, economic asset for the utility company turns up into a huge uh, cleanup job. Uh, so, you know, it can go from a few billion dollars of assets to, uh, you know, several billion dollars in cleanup that the company will have to be spending on. And once you recognize there are these accidents, you're going to have to do something about it. Uh, these, uh, that in, includes, for example, how you maintain the plant, how the kind of le the uh, quality controls that you have to put into the construction, uh, the, uh, the care with which the design has to be evaluated, all of these are going to uh, are driving the cost higher. Next, next question, and uh, I will repeat it. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, one thing. Um, in in terms of per unit of energy generated, in terms of per kilowatt hour, uh, and uh, in terms of uh, in, in in just if we divide by that, is it still a very bad option in comparison to other new renewable sources because they generate very little energy, right? And in terms of even yes. with if we compare with time, do we still lose in when we set up a new nuclear power plant? Yes. So, so that is what one of the graphs that I demonstrate uh, that I showed earlier. Uh, in the United States, the cost of generating one unit of uh, electrical energy from a nuclear power plant 
um, is estimated around $160 per megawatt hour. So megawatt hour is per unit of electrical energy. Uh, and uh, the comparable cost for solar and wind, uh, even taking into account the fact that the solar and the wind plants don't operate all the time and so on, uh, is about $40, 30 to $40 per megawatt hour. So this is about four to five times more expensive per unit of electricity that is generated. If you think about units of uh, electrical capacity, then a nuclear plant is even more expensive uh, uh, compared to a solar or a wind plant or even a natural gas plant for that matter. Um, more questions? All of my cost estimates are per unit of electricity. That's, that's where I was doing all the comparisons. More, more questions? Uh, related to that question, how do they work out in um, cost of grams of carbon produced per watt produced? So like uh, if you make solar panels, you have to make a lot of material. And if you include material costs, do you still end up winning? Sorry, I, I couldn't hear the question. Could you repeat it? Okay, so I'm going to try this. Um, if you include material cost for solar panel generations, for example, and nuclear, um, do you still? Does, does the carbon cost yeah. per watt per so, yes. still lower for uh, solar panel electricity? Did you, did you hear that, Ramana? No, I didn't hear it at all. Okay. So I, I heard something Sorry, about I, a material I, I cost really... per for the material that's used in producing the solar plant or the nuclear plant. Is that correct? Yes, for the cost of carbon per megawatt produced, the carbon footprint. If you take that into yeah. account, uh, integrating well, cost know, of material. Yeah. So so two two points. Uh, one is I am not comparing uh, nuclear power with uh, natural gas in, in any of these things, whatever I had talked about. Uh, what I was comparing was nuclear power with solar and wind costs, and all of them are low carbon sources. You can sort of quibble about how many grams of per kilowatt hour a nuclear plant will produce versus a solar and a wind plant. Uh, and the uncertainty ranges in those estimates are so large that I think all of them should be put into the same bucket. And as long as you put it in the same bucket, the addition of a cost per carbon is not going to change in any significant way. Uh, they're both going to be going in exactly the same direction, right? So in terms of the, comp as long as you're comparing low source, low carbon sources, it does not matter. Uh, I thought I also heard another question, which is about the cost of the materials used in the solar plant versus the nuclear plant. And one way to understand uh, why the cost for a nuclear plant might be much greater is that their, uh, the, the higher capital cost estimates reflect the fact that there is a lot of material that, are, that is being used in a nuclear plant, as in the case of a solar plant, as in the case of a wind turbine, because these are all capital cost intensive sources of energy. Uh, and the, the material costs are going into the capital costs. But as long as you're uh, electricity market is sort of functioning reasonably, then those uh, material costs are being reflected in the electricity costs. Yep, we have one, we have the time for one or two questions. Okay, um, quick question. Do you think that if the government um, reduced its regulations on fuel recycling, it would change? Your analysis of nuclear um, energy um, being economically feas feasible. And my second question is, what are your thoughts on nuclear waste vitrification as a potential solution to our current waste problem? So there was, sorry, I couldn't hear there was the two, yes, all. there was two questions. The first question uh, was about if, uh, if you if you change the government restriction on, on fuel recycling, so I guess spent fuel recycling and, and plutonium extraction in the US, will it cost more or less? And the second question 
Uh, remind me to talk over here. Thoughts on nuclear waste vitrification? Yes, uh, your thoughts on, on nuclear waste vitrification as a, as a solution for, I guess, long-term storage, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so the first question, um, there have been lots of studies that have looked at reprocessing of spent fuel, um, and uh, that all of them pretty much say that the cost of nuclear power is going to go up, not down, if you're going to use uh, reprocessed uh, fuel uh, and the plutonium that you extract from it is used in the fuel. Uh, you can understand this in two ways. One is that the cost of uranium is relatively low. Uh, there's plenty of uranium in the world. Uh, it's not a, a particularly uncommon material. Uh, and uh, so it's not um, worthwhile trying to find uh, alternatives to uranium. That's one way to understand. The second way to understand it is that plutonium is a difficult material to deal with. Unlike uranium, it's much more radioactive. So any kind of fuel fabrication will have to be done uh, inside glow boxes uh, with, because you don't want workers to be inhaling plutonium dust and so on and so forth. And so the just the cost of fabricating uh, so-called MOX fuel, mixed oxide fuel that has both uranium and uh, plutonium is more just the cost of fabrication, even if you could get the uranium and the plutonium for free, is going to be more than the cost of the entire cost of mining, um, refining, and, and producing uranium fuel. Uh, so a re a reprocessing of spent fuel is not going to be helping uh, nuclear power uh, economically. And in terms of vitrification, uh, you know, the challenge for uh, nuclear waste uh, is the pro uh, there are sort of, as I mentioned, there's a technical challenge and there's a social challenge. The technical challenge is that you are going to have to deal with these radioactive forms that are going to stay hazardous for hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, and it does not matter whether it was vitrified or not vitrified, you still have to deal with that. Uh, and there are going to be enormous uncertainties in terms of how a re any repository where you store these kind of waste uh, is going to behave over these very long periods of time. Uh, so vitrification uh, may have sort of shorter term benefits, but your in vitrification is something which you're going to be doing only with liquid waste. Uh, but the, the liquid waste are being produced when you do reprocessing and reprocessing in general produces a, a larger number of streams of nuclear waste. And some of them are quite uh, voluminous, so they have to be actually expelled into the biosphere. So in a way, reprocessing makes this the uh, waste problem worse. Well, thank you, uh, Ramana, for for answering all our questions today. Um, I want to thank you again for for this uh, uh, for sharing uh, your thoughts and for for this talk. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm very sorry I couldn't hear you properly. I was not in person, but uh, I will be staying online and, and listening to the others. Yes. Thank, thank you. you.